Hello and welcome to the DVD from the cage to the street. My name is Richard. Uh, today we're going to be covering some of the foul tactics that I would say are go-to techniques for if you're in any kind of trouble in a street fight scenario. There is really no question as to whether these techniques work or not. The only question is when you should use them and how you should train to use them. The reason I say there's no question about whether they're effective or not is because we need to simply look at the fact that these are exactly the same techniques and movements that are banned under all cage fighting rules. Uh, that's no coincidence. These simply are the techniques that cause the most damage and the most amount of trauma to an opponent with the least amount of training. So they're actually quite easy to apply and they do cause a lot of damage. That being said, make sure when you're training these techniques you do two things. I would like you to be able to train as realistically as possible but safety always comes first. So you're always looking in your training and when you're drilling these techniques to train as safely as possible and then to get as close to the reality as possible. We're going to show you during the course of this DVD exactly how you should run the drills that will allow you to train your neurology and your body to produce these techniques in a way that is natural under stress circumstances. So that's the basic outline introduction to what we were looking at in the DVD. There's a few key points I need to cover. All these techniques that I'm going to be showing you they do correlate with many of the foul tactics that are now banned under the UFC rules. You should never really be using these though. If you have to use any of these techniques, they're only there to get you out of trouble that you should never have gotten into in the first place. When it seems like a violent confrontation is inevitable and you can't negotiate your way out of it any further, and you should be studying how to negotiate your way out of fights, first and foremost you should be seeking to avoid fights. What you should be looking to do is to study using something called a fence or an on-guard stance or proxemics. You do this when you're negotiating with a potential assailant to set them up for a preemptive strike. I can't cover these points in this DVD. It's probably worth a DVD in and of itself. It's a whole field of study. But basically this is how it looks. If you come forward for a second for me. If it looks like you're being attacked and someone's uh, verbally attacking you and you're still at that point of negotiation, you should be studying to use your hands when you're speaking in a way that isn't very aggressive, still quite calm, but that puts them out here. So that if he suddenly goes for a strike, I'm not stood with my hands down and to the side, they're kind of up. The, one of the key rules, the key principles for this is you want to make sure that your hands are always higher than his. If he puts his hand, if you go like that, you don't want to let people start talking at you over here as they're getting more agitated and doing this kind of thing. I've heard it said a few times you, you would never let someone touch your fence more than three times. Don't ever let someone touch you without your permission. Don't let them do it once. If I walk onto his fence, the first time I touch him, he should be going for preemptive strike. The preemptive strike that Brad's will go for will most likely be a right cross because boxing is his favorite way of doing things. I would probably do a similar thing. My, my right cross isn't a boxing right cross, it's from a distant, different style of martial art. I'll throw a more looping style right cross over that way. If it's closer than that, another good preemptive strike would just be to elbow straight into the jaw. As I say, we're not covering preemptive strikes today, but if it looks like someone's going to kick off on you, keep them at a range. If it's going to become physical and you can't negotiate and walk away safely, and you have to be realistic about this, if you don't feel like you can walk away safely, if you're genuinely under threat, then set them up, keep talking to them, set them up, and give them a preemptive strike. If they don't go on the first preemptive strike, keep going with all your major tools until you drop the person and they cease to be a threat. That's the way you want to train. So these techniques, these foul tactics that I'm going to show you, you would only use if you failed to knock the person out, or if perhaps you went for a preemptive strike and you missed. Maybe if he's a good boxer, maybe he'll just lean back as that comes out and then go for his own counter strike. Bang! And you end up in all kinds of positions that are not so comfortable to be in. Common street fighting positions, one thing would be a side headlock. You see this a lot in street fights. Thank you. Another thing that you'll see a lot of is just a straight stand-up clinch. If he's a tie boxer, he'll go this way. If he's a wrestler, he'll give you a double underhook. Or if he's just a basic thug, he'll just grab you however he can, whichever way, or maybe even grab you by the hair or by the clothes. So there's two things that you often see in street fights that you should be training to deal with. Another thing you should be training to deal with is what I call the grab and jack hammer, which is if, if uh, my opponent covers up, we're in the middle of a fight, he's actually covered up. People get so panicked and so I write in the middle of fights, they'll just do this kind of thing. It's not actually doing him any damage, it's probably going to break my knuckles. But if you've watched a street fight, you'll have seen that wild Jerry Springer style throws that come out of nowhere and they have very little effect. These are the kinds of things you need to train for. Okay. 
the last thing that you must make sure you're training for, and if you get into any of these positions, that's when it's appropriate to use the foul tactics that I'm about to show you. Because if you're up inside here, this is not where I want to be with this guy. I don't want to be grappling with him and trying to prove who's the better wrestler. I need to get him off me, finish him so I can move on to the next person. Apart from that, he may have a weapon. Also make sure when you're training, you train, we've just shown you three common situations to get into. There's a final, very, very common situation that you need to study. You often see in self-defense people attacking each other like that and grabbing the lapels, just grab my lapels, this kind of thing. No one will ever attack you like that. What's far more common is for someone to get hold of you and throw you into a wall or something. Just grab me, throw me, like that. Bang your head, bang your shoulder. They'll throw you in, get you in there, pin you in, and then start giving it to you. So train for these things. When you're using the file tactics, you want to use them when you've when you fucked up, when you made a mistake, when you've got into these positions. Otherwise, you should simply be looking to negotiate and avoid. If you can't do that, use a preemptive strike to knock the person out or knock them over. Or if that doesn't work, you want to be using your major tools out here until it is finished so you can just get away. If all those things fail, then you'll use the foul tactics that I'm going to show you now. Okay, the first foul tactic that we're going to look at today is the eye gouge. If you read um, cage fighting rules under pretty much any federation, this is the one that will come first. I'm just going to deal with a few of the myths about eye gouging with you first that I often hear people say. One of the things that people think is if you put your finger inside someone's eye, that it's just going to blind them straight away. Most of the human body is a lot more resilient than we tend to think of it as being. Your eye doesn't just burst like a ripe grape if you put your finger in there. It's quite resilient. What will happen is, if I try and put my finger in his eye, it's just basically, it's a big wet ball, and it will slip off and to the side, and it will probably go around the back. When you're attacking the eye, you always attack straight forward, whether it's a strike or a gouge. If you're going to gouge the eye, you take your thumb here to the tear duct side of the eye, and you push forward and round to the back. This will not blind the person. What will blind the person, and you must be careful of, is if your nail goes across the front of the eye and damages the retina and the lens at the front of the eye. That can cause permanent damage. Another thing that people think is if you put your eye in around the back, the eyeball will pop out. Very, very unlikely. You'd have to put a lot of pressure on. The reason being, the eye socket is a lot smaller than the real size of the eye. We often think of the eye as being that big. It's not. It fills all this area here and the hole is quite small. It's deliberately designed that way so that it won't come out. If it did come out and it was hanging by the optic nerve, which the optic nerve fits at the back of the eye socket there, then the person would be blind. The nerve does not stretch. If it does come out and it's hanging by the optic nerve, then the person will be blind for life. Final myth I'd like to cover with you is the idea that if you drive your one of your fingers up and in, that it will go into the brain and kill the person. Not very likely. It's all hard bone behind there, and it's not eggshell thin. I hear sometimes that inside the eye the bone is eggshell thin, or on the temple it's eggshell thin. That's ridiculous. Why would it be? That would just make it very, very easy for you to get damaged. The body's constructed a lot better than that. So you can actually get your finger inside the eye and not cause that much damage. Now, I'm not saying that that means you should take this technique lightly. It's a very, very dangerous technique. And it will, if you apply it and the person's not expecting it, it can cause the person to convulse and vomit and it can make them go unconscious. But it is a very, very good technique to use if you're in trouble. If the person's very, very strong and they have you in a bear hug kind of position like this and it's hard to get, get them off you, if they've got a lot of upper body strength, it's a nice technique to go to and you just slide your thumb in there. Um, I would say most of the time, if you're going to try and find the eye, the way of doing it, just let go of me for a sec, is you want to be able to drill to find any part of the person's body, it doesn't matter what it, you're attacking, without looking. So you need to be able to do this, not, you don't have to literally be blindfolded, but you want to be able to find what you're looking for without looking at it. And you've just seen me do it there. If I want to find his eyes, I will slide my palm to the side of his face and then run down his forehead to the eye. The other way that you might do it is you might creep up from the throat to the cheek, and if I find his cheekbone, I can drive up and in that way for the eye gouge. And all you're going to do is just drive the fingers forward. Here's a few variations for you. If I was going to eye gouge his eye that way, I could combine that with an attack to the ear by hanging my nails into the back of his ear cartilage and ripping forward, I can drive the thumb into the eye and twist this way. 
causes a lot of pain and it doesn't allow him to wiggle out. You'll notice throughout the DVD when I'm attacking pressure points, whatever I'm doing, I'll always hold the back of the person so they can't just wiggle away from me. I don't want them to be able to get away from me. So here's one way of eye gouging, like that, or you can hook with your fingers underneath the jaw into the pressure points under the chin, under the jaw, and drive the thumb in that way as well. It makes it a lot harder for the person to wiggle out. So these are very, very close range techniques from the kinds of scenarios I showed you before. If we're up in here and we're grappling and he's quite a strong guy, then I can get my thumbs in there and I'll produce a result very, very quickly. That's efficiency. I want to produce a massive result very, very quickly because he could be huge. He could be on steroids, he could be on cocaine. There could be six of them, so I need to be able to get him off, bang, finish him and get away as quickly as possible. You might use this at a long range as well. It can also be used as a combination to a preemptive strike. You can flick up and into the eyes, and when that flinch comes out, bang, straight in, you're going for your preemptive strike. You could also actually go for an eye gouge. When you're doing it, I sometimes like to see Wing Chun guys, Jeet Kune Do guys, some Japanese styles, they'll do it stiff-fingered, and they train their fingers to be very, very strong. Don't do a stiff-fingered jab to the eyes. If I get that wrong, and I hit him there, or there, I can break my fingers. Do it loose, that way. So if I miss, it doesn't matter. It's still going to upset him. And you do it that way. Very, very loose, very, very fast. It's not a finishing technique, it's an opener for something else. Is that annoying you? Slightly. Okay, so you can use it as a long range that way. As a medium range technique, it's quite nice. If we're here and we're in a clinch, and you will, you will get into this position if you're unlucky enough to be in a street fight, don't just panic and bang away on the person's face. Don't headhunt. Pick a target. Choose a specific target. Be precise. Don't just bang away. You want to think of yourself as more like a sniper. So you're actually going to look at a specific target and take it out. If I just bang him on the chin here or on the jaw with that amount of range, I'm probably not going to get him. What I can do is I can target his eye and just hit straight forward with my fist. Could, if I chose to, extend the knuckle that way, bang it in there or with the base of my palm. If you're feeling flash, I sometimes see close jiu-jitsu practitioners doing it with the wrist or the back of the hand, and they actually can get a pressure point knockout from that. So you bang the eye straight back into the brain that way, and it causes a lot of pain and can produce a knockout. Whilst we're on this medium range uh, technique, let me just show you something else. If you're at this range and you're looking for a target, this isn't to the eyes now. If I'm going to hit the jaw and I want to produce a knockout, I need to be able to hit down and in. If you watch uh, probably about at least 30% of boxing knockouts, it's not a coincidence that the guy gets knocked out, his, hand, his, his head is lower. If, the other per if his head is lower than my head and I hit him, I've got to hit him down and into the jaw and that's what produces the knockout. So the next time you're watching a boxing knockout, you'll see this. The, you'll often see if he's throwing a right hook, if, if I'm lower than his head, the chance of me, if my head's lower than his head and he hits me on the jaw, the chance of me getting knocked out is a lot higher. Another nice little target you've got from here is the side of the nose. When attacking the nose, you never hit straight in, you always hit it to the side. So you'd hit bang across the nose there. Here's another tool that we can use against the eye, and that's the elbow. So if you're in this range, you could just drive it into the temple or actually across and into the eye. You sometimes see in Muay Thai fights, they'll go left elbow to left eye and smash it in that way and they're actually going for the meat of the eyeball for that one which obviously will knock someone out and will swell it up and stop the fight quite quickly. So these are just various ways that you can attack the eye. One of the things I've noticed now in cage fighting rules they say no eye gouging of any kind. The reason for that is because when people are on the ground in the earlier cage fights you'd see people doing things um, it only, this only really works if he had the ground against him, but they drive their shoulder into the eyeball, which is quite painful, or the chin. So if he's actually got me in a bear hug, I might use this stood up. If I can't bite him, if I can't punch him, I might just try and get, especially if you've got any, um, if you've got any hair on your chin, it's pretty uncomfortable, and we'll probably give him conjunctivitis as well. Okay, so that's eye attacks. Next file tactic that we are going to look at is the headbutt. Okay, so let's deal with the uh, tools, then we'll look at the targets of the headbutt, and then we'll actually look at some of the techniques for the headbutt. The tool of the headbutt is uh, where the um, cranial structure is at its strongest, which is around the corners of the head, this way. This is where the head is actually structurally its strongest. Don't headbutt with the front of the head 
where the hairline uh, stops. The reason for that is there are two veins that run up the front of the forehead this way. And if you strike there, you can split your head open. I've got a few scars from doing that where I've actually hit people with that part of my head into a similarly hard part of their head and it just splits. It bleeds very, very heavily and very, very quickly and will blind you. So avoid hitting with that part. You can hit just underneath here or just above it here, that's fine. But if you can, try and hit as far back as you can, but avoiding the cranial split here, which is a bit of a pressure point. The back of the head, you can hit with, that's very, very strong. The corners of the head, you can hit with, that's very, very strong, so you can hit either way there. So just be aware of hitting with the actual hairline. It can split and it bleeds very, very heavily. Okay, the targets for the head, but quite limited really around the head. You always want to be aiming below the line of the eyes, so you'd strike to the eyebrows to split them, possibly around the eye socket area to swell the eye up, to break the nose. You can split the lips, be very, very careful. If the person's mouth is open, you don't want to strike into the teeth, because if you do that, there's a lot of bacteria in the mouth, it's the most dirty place on the body, it's actually dirtier than the rectum, it has more bacteria in it, and if you strike into it, or if you punch it, any part of your body that cuts that, you can get the, the bacteria from the mouth into your system and it's very, very dangerous and infect you quickly. So avoid the mouth unless you're certain it's closed. You can go below the line of the mouth to the jawline, into the hollow of the cheekbone here, into the cheekbone, into the ear, under the chin. You can actually hit slightly round behind the ear into the back of the neck there as well. There are places on the body that you can head but, but these are the primary areas that you want to go for. Now there isn't a long, medium and short range for the headbutt per se. I have seen people throw headbutts from quite a long way out, from this kind of range out, and throw it bang all the way in. It's pretty dangerous. I mean, if, you, if it connects, and it connects properly here, I'm going to take that person out and it's going to do a hell of a lot of damage to his face. So I'd better be justified, and I need to make sure I'm definitely, definitely legally justified in doing that. I prefer not to take those kinds of chances, because if I leap out from this kind of range, and throw it in, and I miss him, I'm going to, all kinds of bad things could happen as I go past him. So I would prefer to do it from a medium range, if you're at the, the kind of the trapping or the boxing range, if you can get in here, then break that and come in. And I prefer to do it with the side of the head. Nothing here can really break, and you can give that a good whack. And even if it goes into the side of his head, provided I'm doing it with the corner, the top corners of my head, nothing there will break and the skin won't split. Don't just go for one massive banging shot Go in and hammer away with the side of the head three or four shorter shots. That way you can start to pull the person round with your clinch work, move his face up to your head, even pull the head, his face into your head as you're making the strike so you've got a two-way motion. Bang, that way will do a lot of damage. Learn to headbutt using the rotation of your neck. So you would strike, you could strike forward this way and then come back that way and then again, boom, just using a lot of head rotation, going for these kinds of targets. On the body, the pressure points are generally located where there's a hollow. So for this headbutt, you go where the eyes are. There's a hollow, the temple, the cheek, around the back of the jaw, anywhere around here you can throw a headbutt into, but make sure it's nice and relaxed. When you're training for this, um, obviously you can't just whack each other with a headbutt because your training partner's gonna fall out with you very, very quickly. So you wanna do it nice and slow. Do exactly the motion you would, make contact with the person, follow through with exactly the same range that you would, but if I do it slowly, it's not gonna hurt him. But he's getting used to taking a strike, and I'm getting used to using my head to strike in that way. But it doesn't matter, even if you're grabbed from the side, if you just grab me around the arms, you should still find ways of getting that head in there. Notice, on that one, I didn't just hit with my knee, I'm also extending my leg, so that I'm actually driving his head back. Don't just think always in terms of, it's either a strike, or a push. Sometimes it can be a strike, then a push. Same with the head. You can crush with your head. Move up and in. If his head's against the wall, or he's on the floor, I can crush him this way. Crush into the face. Or I can grab around the back of his head and grind my head in and cause a lot of pain. You'll see that in cage fights sometimes. I'll get the person up against the side of the cage, and then they'll just drive up and in to push that person into the back. Or if they're on the floor, they can use that to manipulate to get a mount position. So you can crush with the head as well. One of the variation of using the headbutt that um, I think you should be aware of is one that Marco Huis became famous for, which was if he had someone who's a very good boxer and they were throwing punches, he would try and take 
You might take a few on the way in on this one, by the way. He would try and trap them in, and then move inside very aggressively for a clinch, and then just move his head up, bang, that way. Now, I know I have to hit him, because if I follow the line of his chest, his head is there somewhere. Even if he moves his head out of the way, and moves his head back, bang, I'm in a prime position to throw another one in. So when you're drilling for this, if you grab me again, remember just nice and slow, fine ways of fitting your head in, bang, there. Even if you get grabbed from the back, you should be able to create enough space to rotate your neck, throw it in, even get underneath and drive it back up again, up and in, that way. So that's how you drill for the head. You need to take it nice and easy, nice and slow. You can do drills where you work it a little bit faster, but you need to be very, very, very careful. If I was going to drill a little bit faster to throw the headbutt in, you might do it off, say, a punch. If he throws a punch, cover, come inside grab the throat maybe, and then just bang, 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 straight in, driving them backwards. I'm not just going to stand here and throw them in. On each one, I'm going to drive them further and further back, driving them into a wall, driving them into, I don't know if there's a table or a chair in the way, throw them over that. That's a way that you can drill this technique as well. Um, under all cage fighting rules now, you must not ever attack attack the trachea or throat area and they also say under certain rules um, some federations will not allow you to attack the clavicle. The reason why I have right to shirt off is so I can show you exactly the points that we're talking about here. I'm also going to show, show you a few extra points on the body that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. Okay, so the clavicle area. The clavicle runs from the deltoid muscle here around to the um, carotid structure at the bottom here. So it's this muscle if you, as you're sat there if you just touch the top of your chest, run up to the top, there's a hollow in front of your shoulder muscle here. That's where it is. This is the area that you're looking to attack. So the bone actually comes out from the body and there's a hollow behind it. So structurally, it's quite weak. And what it means we can do is this, and it drops the whole body out as the person tries to avoid the pain of that. So you can hang on to it, or you can actually seek to break it using various techniques. So that's the clavicle that I'm going to be discussing with you in a moment. That's the whole area that we're looking at, just so you know exactly where that is. A few other pointers on the body um, that I just want to share with you just very, very briefly. These aren't actually, strictly speaking, banned, but you should be aware of them. Uh, one of the things is the solar plexus. If you're going to attack the solar plexus anywhere on the body, don't do what boxers do, which is to hit up and in that way and strike off it. You need to hit heavy-handed, down and in, this way, anywhere in the body that you're going for, bang, it's down and in. If you're going to attack the solar plexus area, you want to go either straight in towards the spine or slightly in and down at a 45 degree angle, which I'm not going to do very hard, but you strike it this way, sorry, with the first two knuckles, bang, in and down, and that will cause a lot of pain. Basically, anywhere that you're going to strike in the body, you want to go in and down towards the spine. Particularly, there are points, we're not going to cover these today particularly, but you can experiment with this anywhere, down here, from here, right the way through the armpit, we're in straight into the body, down here, here, here and here, you can either strike in as a grappling attack, or bang straight in, and you'll drop the person out. What we're going to look at now though, is clavicle and throat. Okay, so I've shown you the uh, targets for the throat and clavicle attacks. Now these are some of the uh, tools and the techniques. The way that you can attack the throat, uh, primarily you would be looking to attack the trachea. Being aware that if you actually crush the esophagus, you can cause the person to suffocate. You can punch him that way with a horizontal strike or a vertical strike in a Wing Chun style, or you can do it this way with a white, a yoking attack like that, bang. It looks like a push technique, but it's actually not. If he turns around this way, what you're doing is at that kind of a speed, and this kind of strength, I'm just going to practice it into his forearm, it's that kind of strength, it's like a, a jolting and uh, to actually get that choking effect. That will cause the person to start coughing and spluttering and you do it from this range, bang, at that speed, but at the strength that I did it on his arm. That'll get a good cough for you. Another way of uh, causing the person to start coughing and tearing from the eyes is to just chop into the throat that way. This takes quite a lot. It looks very easy. It looks like a little bit of a daft technique, but it actually takes quite a bit of training to pull this off. You have to be fast, you have to be accurate, and you have to know how to tense that side of your palm so that you can, bang, strike it in nice and hard. It's a nice lead-up technique. You start with that bang, 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 and then follow with something else. So you can do it that way, you can do it that way, you can punch in there. The other areas of the throat that you can attack are the uh, jugular, uh, arteries that run down here, 
and they also hold the stomach points, uh, stomach 8, 9 and 10 runs up this way, so you can hit into the side here. If I had the choice, provided the situation was bad enough, if it was a really, really dangerous situation, if there were multiple opponents, or maybe he's got a knife, he's already stabbed me and I'm already injured, rather than punching him into the jaw, I'll just go straight into his throat. Either go in again for the trick here, or for the side there, into the carotid structure around the side, bang, that way. You can also use your elbow to attack the throat. In Krav Maga, in the Israeli army, when they're doing um, throws, sometimes they'll actually throw off the back of an elbow strike into the throat, which causes a lot of pain, and they'll hit it, bang, and then step behind the person and perform the throw. So all these ways you can use to attack the throat. My personal favourite, if I'm seeking to control someone and restrain them, is to use what's called a C grip. It's called a C grip because you create the letter C with your fingers, using the strongest structure of your hand, which is your thumb and your middle finger. These are the strongest fingers. And what you do is you grab the top part of your kit, squeeze the fingers together, and then rise up and in, and it causes the person to come up off their toes. Remember again, whenever you're pressure point attacking, you hold the back of the area that's being attacked I was going to attack his shoulder and hold the back of it that way. So here I'm holding the back of his neck and come in here and C grip him. From here, he's very, very vulnerable to being struck with my head, with my knee, or I could bite him if I was feeling very angry. Um, all these kinds of things you can do. This bit here, the sternal notch, you attack this with two fingers. Squeeze them together, make it as strong as you can. You need to have strong fingers to be able to do this, and you strike in and down. It's not a bang strike in there, in fact, it's more of a push. Remember, you must be able to find all the points without looking. So if I've got my eyes closed or if I'm in very, very close to them, I can't see him, I let my hand creep up his chest here into, the, into that sternal notch and push forward. When you push, jerk forward like that. Jerk into the area. Don't just go nice and gentle and easy unless you're just restraining the person and pushing them away. Jerk it in. Jerk in, down, find the bone and rub the bone at the same time. All in one motion, boom, boom, that way. And it will cause a lot of coughing and the person's eyes will tear up and they won't be able to see. Quite a nice little opening move. Here's just an extra little Jedi trick for you. Down the bottom here we have the carotid structure that runs here. Just take your two fingers and pinch in there. It's quite uncomfortable. You can drag that forward, side to side. It just creates an extra little bit of pain just so you can move the person around. The clavicle area, when we're attacking that, we take our fingers in and either pull in and down and push into them, or these two fingers. Rather than going straight down into the hollow, we drive them in and down towards the neck. I'm doing it this side, I'm actually aiming for his heart, that way, boom, that way. And it drops his knee out as he tries to avoid the pain. You can also just break this area if you choose to, by striking there, or driving in with an elbow, and that will crack the whole area. So basically render most of this fairly useless, unless he's very, very high on drugs. And even then, it won't be as strong. Structurally, it will not be as strong in that whole area. So. It's um, a nice technique to use if you're in a lot of trouble. You need to make sure you're legally justified in using it. Here's a combination attack for you, where you can actually attack the clavicle first, and then roll the knuckles up and into the neck that way. So you attack down, drive them down this way, bring them close to you, and bang, up and in there. And you're actually looking to do it with enough strength, and spare speed rather than strength, with enough speed to create a whiplash effect in his head. So you want to strike him so fast that his head is actually left behind and that can produce a nice little knockout effect. The advantage of using that as a technique is that it doesn't really look like anything. So if you've got witnesses, they would see us up close here, and then his head would go back. It doesn't really look like anything. Whereas if I'm standing here going bang, 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 it looks like something nasty. All they'll see is me pushing him away, and he's going to go unconscious. Where you can use that form, perhaps if you've got a lapel grab, and then the person goes for a strike, and you've covered up from it, you're covering the strike, Take your hand down, and what you do is you grab into the clavicle area from there, bring him down, and then push back in him to get the guy away from you. So you've actually combined two files in one there with that attack, and it doesn't look too aggressive. Nice and sneaky. Okay, the next file tactic we're going to look at is clawing attacks. When you're actually clawing someone, um, there's a lot of places in the body you can go for. As I said to you before, any pressure point attacks will probably be where there's a hollow. Any clawing attacks are anywhere on the body that sticks out, like the ears, the nose, anywhere at all where you see something sticking out, you can attack that by clawing it. On the, um, one of the nice techniques that I like to use combines some of the pressure points on the face. On the eye socket, there are several pressure points. The two that we're going to look at for this, one is here, the bottom of the eye socket, the six o'clock point, if I want to attack that, I drive down and in. And that's quite painful. 
If I want to really, really hang off that, I can do it with both sides to bring his head down and forward. At the 12 o'clock point, there's another pressure point. If I hook that and pull up and into the bone, that's quite painful. I can do that with two there to get the guy's head back. There are pressure points here underneath the cheekbones that I can claw into. If I drive my fingers in up under the cheekbone, straight up and in, that's very, very painful. So what we do is we combine it like this. So you're driving into the cheekbone points with these two fingers, into the eye points with these fingers, and you just push them all together. You grab the guy by the face. Don't worry about being too accurate with that, because even if you slip off the points and you end up just grabbing bits of the cheek or the nose, it's very, very, very painful, and it's going to produce a result for you quite quickly. There's a lot of nerves around here. These are very, very sensitive areas, so it's a good place to go for. So you can grab the face that way. Another nice thing you can do is you can rip into the nose to pull the head round there. That can be used if I butt Raj into a side headlock. He can just go from my nose and rip across that way. And what he's done is actually hooked his nails down into the side of my nose. It works better if the person's got a bigger nose. And you can hook your nails in and just rip the nose right the way across. Underneath the nose, you've got a point here that you can either push into and underneath the chin, you can drive down and in, not straight in. This goes straight in underneath the nose. This goes down and in. All of these points can be clawed. Obviously, be careful when you're clawing anywhere around the mouth that you don't get bitten. You don't want to get your fingers in there. But you can claw this whole area. When you claw, drive the fingers, make a fist, and twist that way. So you're twisting down and away that way. We're going to look at ear attacks in a moment, but obviously you can see it's quite easy to use these kinds of techniques in the ears. Also, on the chest, if the person's very, very muscular, Raj has got quite a muscular build, you can claw in behind the muscle, up and inside it that way. If the person has a bit more body fat, not, not like me, but if, so if I was fat, um, then you can actually, if there's fat there, you just claw straight into the fat, and that's very, very painful. Especially around the sides, around the, uh, around the love handles, if you can claw straight into that. I don't know, maybe if you're going for a hip throw or something, you're in tight with someone, you can claw into that and you can lift them up off their toes. They'll come off their toes right for you, raise the centre of gravity for you, which is very, very kind of them. You can then throw them from there. So you claw in that way. Some of the points that we were looking at before of attacking the trachea, these can be like claw and attacks. You can strike in, grab hold, twist and rip, and as you do, it becomes a clawing attack. So anywhere on the body. If, it doesn't matter what style you practice, say if you're a Muay Thai person or if you're into cage fighting or whatever it is for street fighting, make everything count. So if I was going to give him a Muay Thai counter attack, I don't know, say if I'm going to go for a knee, I could be very nice and just drive my knee in that way. Why should I do that when I can claw into his triceps, claw into his clavicle, hang off in him, bang, and drive it in like that? I'm doing it a lot. <laughs> Nasty away. These are the kind you need to take advantage. And the claw is a very, very nice way of doing it, but you must strengthen your fingers. You need to make your fingertips, your hands, your forearms as strong as you possibly can in order to use these kinds of techniques. So this is more of a, um, this is a thing that will occur incidentally. Whatever the person's attacking you with, if you're at a close range and you can't use a major technique, just start finding things to claw and rip and get hold of. It doesn't matter what it is. It will produce a panic effect in the person but particularly around the face is a good place to go and claw for. Okay, this is the next part of the uh, clawing section and it focuses on um, a different foul tactic. In case fighting they don't allow you to do any kind of groin attacks, I'm not going to linger particularly on this section. It's quite obvious that if you did anything to that area of the body, it would cause pain. If you are going to attack the groin because, say, the person's got you grabbed in a bear hug and your hands are inside and you're going to do it, make sure if you're going to do it, you do several things at once. What you do is you seek to strike the groin and you strike loose. I'm not going to do it, so I'm just going to do it here. Loose like that with a slapping hand. Don't steal the power away from the strike by going eh! with a stiff hand. Nice and loose into the area. You grab, twist and pull down, and as you pull down, drop with your whole body weight. You want to get a fast result very, very quickly. You want to create shock in that person. And all you're going to do is do that to create enough space to get out. It's not just the groin that you could go for. If it's not that serious a fight and you don't want to escalate it to that level, you can also just go for the inner thigh and just grab and twist hold of that. I like to do that sometimes if the person's a Thai boxer and they've got me in a Thai clinch and he throws a knee, I can just get hold of that, tense up, go with the knee, Maybe even jump into it to take the power out of it and grab him across here at the same time as clawing into the face. 
so you've got a push and pull effect uh, rip out that way it's quite a nice thing to do to that area if you're getting if you've been attacked from the back and you don't really know if you can't you don't feel like you can get your elbow in or something you might fake high with an elbow and then with your other hand just go straight for the groin you might not even get the person but if they feel you reaching for it aggressively he'll start to back out or start to screw out with his bum it's very very hard to hold me tightly if he's worried about me hitting him if you're going to strike make sure that you've got the body sensitivity to know without looking exactly where his groin is from the positioning of his head and again this is the thing you need to be doing where you don't rely on your eyes you rely on your body sensitivity so you get a feel for where he is and bang you should be able to find it straight away so what you do if you're going to do a back strike that way it's the same thing again it's nice and relaxed don't telegraph it don't go eh, eh. it's a very very quick thing boom straight in and down and if you miss it doesn't matter you just go bang up and then from the point where you were at okay this is the third part of the clawing section now and it deals with another foul tactic um, from the cage fighting rules you must never attack um, any of the orifices of your opponent or any laceration or cut one nice thing that I like to do uh, for clawing is attacking to the ears as I mentioned before there's a lot of different ways you can do it just grab hold of the back of the ear and simply rip it forward you could grab the ear between your fingers maybe hold the side of the head and push and pull at the same time the person has earrings in but I just got a cute little earring here you can just take that you get to keep any of the person's piercings if they attack you then their piercings are yours so if it's the nipple, the lip the eyebrow, you get to keep it all and make a necklace out of it for them to wear later. Then another way of attacking the ear is to actually strike the ear. You can punch it, you can headbutt it, it's very, very painful. The nicest thing you can do is slap it, clap the ear. And then what you want to do for that is create a hollow with your palm. The hollow of the palm, the reason for that is as it strikes, for a second or two it creates a vacuum. That vacuum will actually perforate his eardrum. I've had people do this to me and it's very, very painful for weeks afterwards. Sometimes by mistake, maybe if the guy's just looking to do a Muay Thai clinch, you get someone who's a little bit keen in a Muay Thai class and they'll rub their gloves over the back of your ears and perforate your eardrum, it's very uncomfortable. Um, I've had people do it to me and they go for a side headlock and they clap the side of your ear. The reason why it's such a problem is if you perforate the eardrum, every time you shower or have a bath or if you jump in a pool, as I foolishly did when it was done to me, the water gets in your ear, it's agony and the pain runs exactly as it did when you were struck. When you get struck with this, the pain runs down through the air, it hurts your throat and down into your stomach and your whole system just starts to shut down, it's that painful. Your um, area for balance is actually situated in the air, so if you give someone a good clap in the air, the chance of you knock, knocking them out is very, very high. You can, you, it doesn't have to be a big strike though. If you are going to go for a big strike, like a Russian martial arts slap, remember it needs to be very, very loose and relaxed. No strength, no muscle whatsoever. And it's very, very loose and up and in. If you really, really throw that, you'll take the person's head off and you will knock them out. Remember, it's a lot easier to knock someone out with an open hand than with a closed fist. You have to be quite skilled to knock someone out with a closed fist. But anyone can throw a slap. Anyone can throw a slap. But the problem is when most people slap is they're either very angry or very scared when they do it. And they do that kind of thing, which is annoying, but it's not as bad as bang. Even if you hit the neck area, you hit the slap into the carotid, it will knock the person out. The bottom of the jaw there, sorry, you can cause a knockout. So, for attacking the ear, bang in that way. If you haven't got the room because the person's got you up tight and close, just pull that head round, bang, pop it in. It only needs to be that far. You can combine attack. If you're feeling nasty and you want to get the person off quickly, strike both sides, same time, bang, pop both ears, and then drive the thumbs in and back. This kind of thing should end the fight unless um, you're in a, a, a really nasty situation with someone who's very, very high on drugs or steroids or something, or they're very, very drunk, in which case you just carry on, you just keep going. From here, I've turned the tables on him with minimal amounts of strength and within a few seconds and driven his head back. And depending on the violence of the situation, I could then from here go for a headbutt or an elbow or just push out and then go to my other tools, whatever your preferences are, whatever style you're trained for, play to your own strengths. Okay, for this section we're going to cover stomping and we're also going to cover attacks to the kidneys. These are another two um, banned tactics now from uh, no holds barred fighting. You mustn't stomp an opponent when they're on the floor, you mustn't 
kick them in the kidneys. The reason being, the kidneys can rupture quite easily. If you stomp a person on the, on the floor, or they're trapped against the wall or something, you'll do a lot more damage. Um, rather than starting from the floor for this section, though, what I wanted to do was just cover kicking stood up, bearing in mind that the principle is no stomping. The reason why they don't want you stomping is because stomping and crushing into the person does a lot of damage. What I see a lot in sport combat kicking styles is this kind of thing where they'll kick off the person as though it's point scoring or that kind of thing. Kick as though you were stomping. Kick the person as though you were kicking down the door. And the idea is to either crush them against whatever's behind them, against the wall, to send them across the room or to kick them down. Don't just kick for the sake of kicking. Stomp through the person. So when you're looking to stomp, don't worry about how it looks. Don't worry about doing some nice little fancy looking technique. Stomp into the person. If you're going to do a front kick, stomp them. Raise your knee up, bang, and crush into them. If you're going to, even if you're going to go for a high kick, make sure that you're throwing full weight and full intention behind it. You can still stomp and go for something high to the face, but make sure it is actually a proper, and you're stomping in and through looking to crush the person. One of the things that you can uh, do is not a pretty looking thing, but it will work. It won't work in the ring because it's too slow. But as a street fighting technique, is it's like a side kick. But what you're doing is you just stomp into the person. Very little. T it's not about how it looks. You're just going to stomp, or even into the leg. Bang! I'm not concerned about whether my guards up or anything. I'm just thinking, crush into the leg, crush into the ribs. That way, if you've got things in the environment that you can hold on to, even if it's just a wall or a car or something, the uh, power that you can deliver higher up into the body will be greatly increased. If I can lean into this as I'm kicking him, then I've got a lot more power. You'll notice what I'm doing as well, is I don't stay upright, which is good martial arts form, form, I lean over that way, so that my spine is aligned with the angle of the attack. The reason for that being is because that's how your body works. I'm a lot stronger stomping down that way than if I try and raise my leg that way. So, take your whole body there and strike that way. Okay, so to continue this section on stomping um, an opponent, uh, one of the other foul tactics that is uh, written into all cage fighting rules now is that you mustn't spike the opponent to the floor when you throw them. I'm not covering that because that's not really um, a street fighting technique. It's unlikely that you'll be in a position where you can get in that close and actually be able to pick someone up to be able to spear them down into the floor in such a way that would break the neck. We're not looking at that. Uh, I never really train throws particularly. If someone happens to go to the floor, then it's because I've been beating on them so much or I just push them over. I keep it very, very simple. If I am going to try and take someone to the floor, the principle is very, very simple. Where the head goes, the body must follow. If we're in the middle of a fight, and I don't know whatever's been happening, I want him to go to the floor, I would just take his head and drag it down, maybe strike a few times and then take him down to the floor. You can do like a tie style move and pull down and away and drag the person down. Now, as soon as he hits the floor, what have I got available to me? I'm not going to show you the most obvious stomps because you can work this out for yourself. It goes without saying, it's very, very dangerous to kick someone full force in the face, to boot them in the back of the neck, you could break their neck. If he's got a curb here, I could bounce his head off that and the chance of him dying is very, very high. So don't do it unless it's really, really required. And you need to make the, the judgment call as to whether it's necessary to stamp full force in someone's head or into their neck. The other foul tactic we were talking about is kicking into the kidneys. If you stomp someone in the kidneys, you could split them and there's a chance that they may um, die from the poison that comes out of the kidneys and just spills out into the body. It can kill them. Um, if you're going to do it, if they fall to the floor, Techniques that I would use, I see people training this way, stamping the calf off the bone, stamping the heel where it's like that. You're going to struggle to justify that in court. One thing you can do though, and it doesn't look as bad to witnesses, is you can step on it to hold the person down. Just keep the person there. Tell, stop. Don't move. Hold the person down and try and de-escalate de the situation a little bit. If that's not reasonable, if it's not realistic because you're getting attacked from all sides and there's weapons involved, I would... I would Hesitate to stamp on someone's leg, but if you choose that, that's if you decide that's what's necessary, then do it. But be aware that that will break the leg very, very easily. Even if you're not heavy, it doesn't matter. This guy could be he could be 25 stone, and I could be 10 stone. If I drop my weight into there, it's going to break it. 
If he's up close, another sneaky technique that you can use, I could just pop my knee into his head that way and just bang it in and no one's going to really see what happened. Bang, straight in there. You can use a knee drop into the side here to drive him further down, catch him and twist down and in. I could also stand on his hands, but without, if I wanted to stamp on it, again, be aware that will crush the hand. You will basically break the person's hand open, but you can cause a lot of pain and not that much damage by just pressing, pressing into the area. Another thing I want to cover with you is this, and, and you'll see this a lot in pentaxilla, and they use it in Muay Thai competition. If you're sneaky, as the person falls over in the middle of a fight, if there are witnesses there and you want to do them damage and get away with it, pretend to fall onto them. You'll see Thai fighters do this, and they fall into their opponent, knees and elbows out, bang, bang, oh, sorry, and they fall over into the person. If the person's the other way around, it works even better. You can drop into them that way. So there are things you can do from here without going like that. And this, which looks very aggressive, you can pop your knees in, you can fall onto them, you can drop that way, bang, and it doesn't look quite as aggressive, but you're still maintaining control over the person. And you can step into various places as you do that. Okay, the final foul tactic that I'm gonna look at today is the downward elbow to the back of the neck. I'm not really that keen on you doing any kind of downward elbows in the um, UFCs now, but particularly to the back of the neck. It's very, very dangerous. Now, you might incidentally happen to get in this position in a street fight. If someone's uh, been watching a few too many UFC tapes and they do a really bad double leg takedown on you, which Raj would never do this way, but if they do do it that way, you just very simply block it by going into what's basically like a low horse stance, getting your forearm inside there, and then you drop the elbow into the back of the neck. Take your hand really, really high and drop with the whole of your body down and in. As it lands, you bend your knee so it goes right way through that target. That's how you do it incidentally. If the person's going for a poor double leg takedown, you can use it that way. Or you can do it aggressively. As I said before, if I'm going for a throw or anything, I like to work with the head. And one of the things you can do with the head is bring the head down. Bring it down into this area. And then once you've got it down, bang, 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 drive it in. You probably will cause a knockout within the first couple of strikes, but if not, just keep going. And the whole area here is very, very vulnerable, particularly the base of the skull where it meets the neck here. You don't have to go for accuracy. Realistically, in the middle of a street fight with the adrenaline pumping, you're not going to be able to slot that in perfectly. But if you're aiming for that area, boom, you'll get it. And give it nice, big movement straight down and in, and drive the person right the way down into the floor. If you're feeling nasty, combine it, bang and there, or even, at the same time. Okay, so this isn't, uh, we're not really going to cover drills extensively on this tape, but I'm just going to give you a few ideas for the situations under which you might apply these foul tactics, how you can combine them together, and from this you should be able to create your own drills. Remember, you're always looking to train as safely as possible, but as realistically as possible. And there are lots of different ways that you can apply these kinds of things. For example, imagine a guy has caught me and he's got me around the lapels. I made a mistake, I should never be here, maybe I, was, I wasn't aware and I got ambush attacked. And he's just jackhammering into the back of my head. A very simple thing that you can do to begin with is, uh, by the way, if someone's hitting you in the head, don't worry about it. I mean, unless he's got a knuckle duster on or massive rings, probably take that all day and his knuckles will break before my head does. Just turn your face away, turn the back of your head into a strike. And then all you're going to do, even without looking, just find his face. Straight away, good principle, find the face. Because remember, the face has got all those lovely pressure points you can go for. And it doesn't matter what I go for here. I could go for a rip, rip his cheek, rip his ear, go for an eye gouge. An eye gouge would be a nice thing to do to push his head back. Straight away, within the first few seconds. He was punching me a second ago. I was the victim. Bang, bang, bang. And now, straight away, oh dear, I've turned to... And it doesn't matter how big he is or how big I am because you can't put muscle around your eyeball, as far as I know. So as soon as I've managed to get that away, he's going to be worrying less and less about this. Don't fight with this. Don't try and thumb lock it or anything like that. Look at what's available. Look at what's... Relax. So the first thing you do when you're being attacked is just turn away, turn the main target away so you're not going to get your face pulped up. Realise where his body is, get to his face and see what's available. And sink your weight. As I sink my weight, immediately I'm starting to think what would be available with his groin here, maybe the knee, maybe off the back of that I could be coming in and clawing again. Coming back to using my major tools. Ooh, his head's going down, his head's going down. 
We've got that foul tactic to the back of his head. Maybe he moves past me. Now at this point, don't you start doing what he's just doing, panic punching him there. Think, okay, what have I got from here? The kidneys. Downward elbow into the kidneys maybe. Then instead of worrying too much about striking again, maybe I could start to rip his face, push him down this way. Bring him round. Headbutt here, maybe a bite. Downward elbow again, sorry. Up and knee into the face. All this kind of thing, keep him moving. Maybe then he's going to turn the tables and start hitting me again. Remember, you need to be able to train so that you can take a punch. And psychologically, you're not going to go, go and punch. You're going to go, <laughs> and worry about it. You've got to be able to box. Take that hit, bang, roll with it. Cover up. Sometimes it's going to happen. Like we were saying before, where you're going to drive the headbutts in. So we're now in a bit of a sticky situation. So I need to come up and in. Maybe I'm going for a clinch to drive forward for the headbutt. But you have to train in such a way that you can flow from one position back into the next, back into the next position. Always coming back to your major tools, whatever you're training for. So the foul tactics that we have in this DVD are your backup system. These are the things, your go-to techniques when things are going wrong, when you made a mistake, when you're being ambush attacked. Because you should be using your awareness so that you don't get into these situations. If someone really, really locks you in, remember as we said at the beginning of the DVD, you line them up and then you give them a preemptive strike. But that doesn't always work out that way. You could be looking at something else, you could be conversing, having an argument with someone, and then have his friend come over and give it to you right in the face. You need to be able to deal with that without shutting down and just going, oh, covering up. You need to be able to deal with that so that you, you should be training. So that from there, even there, I haven't given up. I'm now clenching my jaw, turning away. He's going to hit me, but I'm turning away so I can take it, so that I can regain my balance, even if it's only to get to here and start thinking about counter-attacking. From here, he may grab me with both hands and then drive the headbutt in. Bang, that way. And as he's headbutting in, I can't, I, I haven't had time stopping, so I've just got to clench my jaw and turn the major part. I don't want to get this. No. So I turn away here and just try and create some distance. It could have someone else attacking me from over there. But straight away, once I've dealt with the initial, oh shit, then I've got to go, right, okay, now he's headbutting me. What can I do? If I just put my hand there, that makes all the difference in the world. It doesn't matter how strong he is. If he's still headbutting me, it's my hand that's hitting me. So I should be able to stop that from hurting me quite as much. And look, from here, the thumb just slides right into the eye. Grab him like a bowling ball, into the ear, into the eye. Turning, twisting. As soon as you've got this purchase again, the fight's turned. Now, when this spine's twisting, this whole body's twisted around like this, your Muay Thai strikes are going to be that much more effective. Remember, I keep referring to Muay Thai. You don't have to do Muay Thai, but in street fighting, you must be able to hit people as hard as you possibly can. Hit them with the hardest parts of your body. Them being your head, your elbows, and your knees. So what the system works is when you fuck up, when people get hold of you and you've been ambush attacked, use a foul tactic <laughs> to get that distance to get you back to using your major tools, your elbows, your knees, and then foul tactic again, rip under the into the nerve points here, rip the ear, bang down and then bang down that way, that way. That's how the system strings itself. Okay, so that's the end of the DVD from the cage to the streets. If you have any further questions or you require any further training tips or ideas, please come to the site, streetfighttech.com, and post on the forum or send me an email. All that remains for me to say is thank you very much to my training partner, Raj, and to Peter for filming today. I hope you enjoyed the DVD. Make sure you get in contact with me soon. Thank you.